hello 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 i'm so sorry that i've come in late um technical issues there gosh that was a bit of the heart raising heartbeat raising moment there um i gosh are we i can't even see if we're live at the moment i'm going to talk as if we are gosh i don't know what's happened here somehow somehow ah Yes, I can see the top of my head, so we're live. I'm so sorry. <gasps> my goodness me. Whew. I hit the button and nothing happened. And then it said, sorry, video failed to load. Anyway, I'm here. So, and thank you if you've been waiting. I'm so sorry about that. So welcome indeed to Knitter Matters Season 2, Episode 12. And whether you're a regular viewer or you're new to Knitter Matters, uh, watching live or the replay later. I'm very grateful for you taking the time to join me. I'm Cheryl Lampard. My company, I'm an image consultant. My company is Star Matters International. I have two passions throughout my life, which are sewing and knitting. I also used to be the proud owner of a yarn store in Brighton, England. And one of the great joys of owning a yarn store is that you get to teach people how to knit. And it's a great pleasure all these years later to be able to help people with their knitting and teach them how to knit, albeit via a different platform. Now, this episode, apart from being a bit catastrophic at the start, is actually quite a special episode. Well, it is the 13th today, isn't it? It is the 13th. So although in calendar terms, where we've already passed our first year anniversary of Knitter Matters, this episode actually marks 52 episodes of Knitter Matters. So it's 52 weeks since we started. And it's actually thanks to all of you that, are, that we're a year in. You've kept it going. And initially when I started, I didn't know if I'd just be talking to myself in, in Facebook land. Anyway, that hasn't been the case. And I'm so grateful to you. And um, I do hope you're enjoying the series. Now, if you've watched before, especially in the last few weeks, you might notice my from my surroundings that I'm back in my studio in Naples, Florida. Now, although I'm missing the spring trees and the buds coming out in the northeast, it's very good to be back in my studio. And I have Mabel behind me. I hope you can see. I'll swing out the way if I can. Mabel behind me, all decked out uh, in her finery. And she is looking a little bit different this week. Because this week is a bit different. We're not doing any knitting, but we're looking at a very important component in any knitting project, and that's colour. Now, sometimes it's hard enough just choosing one colour, but when it comes to choosing several for a project, that can be overwhelming. And I know from the messages that I get and from the knitting forums that I belong to, that combining co colours is a challenge to many of you. And I understand that completely. I'm going to ask you to bear with me just for a moment as I move the camera to the desktop so we can get on with it. And it just takes a minute because I'm on my own again. So it takes a minute to adjust the position. So please bear with me. I will, um, as we go along, if I see you pop up, I promise I will say hello. But just bear in mind, it's actually quite a challenge sometimes to uh, see who's who's watching because I, I I've got a computer to the uh, left of me let me just get make sure I'm in the right place if I've got that cross there then I'm good to go okay I think that might work okay let's get that down a little bit better I'll work with that I think I can work with that Oh, I can see a few people. Hello, Patricia Glenn, and hello, Sylvia. Thank you, and Jill, thank you so much for watching. Ah, that's better yet. Okay, right, let's get going. So, now, we did touch on some colour basics in Season 1, Episode 32, and we included the, the colour wheel. And we're going to delve into it a bit deeper this time because I think it's a really important thing. Now, you can't see that, can you, so well? So I'm going to lift that up a bit because that's a bigger item. I'm going to, sorry, a bit of adjustment here. I'm going to lift up a bit. Ah, yes. It's actually quite important that you see that color wheel. So let's raise it up a bit. Otherwise, you won't see what I'm doing with it. And that's kind of a waste of all my efforts then. 
and you'll get frustrated because you won't be able to see things quite rightly. Let's go up a bit more. Oh, this is where I so miss my cameraman. Oh. Right, I think I think we might be there now. Let's see. Let's see. I've just got a position. Ah, right. Okay. Let's hope that's okay. So our color wheel. Essentially, a color wheel. Okay, I'm moving it around again. Uh, there's a few seconds delay on this, so I can't see what you can see at the same time, if that makes any sense. I'll, I'll make sure I move it around so you can see what I'm doing, otherwise I don't want to be here all night just moving a colour wheel around. That would be not good. Okay, so essentially a colour wheel is a way of showing the relationships, be showing the relationships between colours on the spectrum. So it's, it's a way to show the relationships of those colours. So, and then again, I'm going back to maybe sort of school art classes, but it's worth a refresher because we don't always spend time on this sort of stuff in later life, but uh, it's really worth understanding a bit about basic colour theory. So primary colours, our primary colours are red, and I'm going to do a little balls of yarn, which makes it much more fun, blue and yellow. And what that means when it comes to primary colours, they can't be mixed by, they can't be reproduced by mixing any other colours together. They're, you could call them pure colours, but that's stretching it a bit. But the point is they can't really be mixed, they can't be created by mixing other colours together, okay? I hope that's you're with me there. All right. Secondary colours are basically two primary colours mixed together. So when we mix our red and yellow, we're going to get orange. Actually, if I move these further in, you'll be able to see them. So when we mix yellow and red together, we're going to get orange. Kind of any of you with children that have spent weeks and weeks homeschooling them, you'll probably been doing quite a lot of this but anyway for those of us that don't have children or you've forgotten how this works this is what we're doing if we mix blue and red together we get violet let's put that that way around so you can see so we get violet if we mix blue and yellow together together we get green so that's that's our secondary color so that's real stuff that we know then we go on to tertiary colours, and that means when you get one primary colour and one secondary colour that are mixed. So in this instance, we would have between the red and the violet, violet, not violent, <laughs> we would get red violet. And between blue and violet, we would get blue violet. Between blue and green, we would get blue-green. Let's move that down a bit so you can see the yarn colour. And between green and yellow, we'd get yellow-green. Between yellow and orange, we'd get yellow-orange which all seems straightforward when you see it like this. It's when you try and think of it without the aid of a visual, it gets more complex. And our red and our orange would give us red-orange. All good so far. So I think using the little balls of yarn, you can really see how that works. So that's a basic color wheel. While all these little balls of yarn are still on my wheel, I want to talk about analogous colours. Now, analogous is defined as two things with a similar function or feature that are comparable to one another. Now, that sounds really complicated, but it simply means it's colours located next to each other on the colour wheel. So that could be, and it's going to be in threes, because it's, it's what's next to each other, related to each other on the colour wheel. So it could be the aqua, the blue-green, it could be the true green, it could be the yellow green, it could be the orange, the yellow, uh, sorry, the orange, the yellow, orange and the yellow, it could be the red, 
the red orange and the orange. It could be red violet, the violet and the blue violet. It could be any combination and of course it could be the blue green, the blue and the blue violet. It can be any combination but it's going to be two other um, pieces that align, that relate if you will, to one of the colours. So it simply means analogous, when you hear the phrase analogous colours, it simply means that the, the colours are located next to each other on the colour wheel and it's going to be three of them. Now analogous colour schemes are really good when you don't want to create too much contrast. Because they relate to each other, let's take these three, you're never going to get a problem with just a contrast that you don't like. You're going to get a, a more sort of graduated look depending how you use it in your knitting. On the other hand, complementary colours, and that's spelt with an E, complementary with an E, they're opposites on the colour wheel. Let me take a few things away for the moment, and then we can always bring them back. So, a really good one to show you is red-green. They're opposites on the colour wheel. Now, complementary colours, because they're opposites, they can be used to create visual interest, but they can also create a visual discomfort. And the, and the red and green is a case in point. If you've ever had an eye test at the opticians, you'll recall that there's a red and green image with black writing on it. And what happened? The, the two colours, that they almost sort of buzz. They, they tend to intensify each other. And it's only then with the black writing in it, in between, that we can, the optician can work his or her magic and they can, you know, help us with our vision. But those two colours in particular are, are quite jarring together because each intensifies the others. But makeup artists regularly use oranges, orange type colours, to help with um, counteract areas of redness and to counteract blue, um, sorry, blue and purplish undertones. So makeup artists, when they're trying to counteract a reddish, a high redness on the skin, they'll often use a green based, um, either a lotion or a foundation to actually balance that out. Again, complementary colors. It's almost as if in that instance, they balance each other out, but they really, that sort of thing really works. On um, certain skin tones, where you get maybe a bluish sort of areas, particularly under the eyes. A makeup artist will use um, sort of almost peachy, orangey shades um, to counteract the blue-violet. Anything within that spectrum, obviously not as vicious as, as those colours, but that's the principle of it, that those opposites, opposites attract, if you will, and, and that's how that sort of thing can work. So although um, complementary colours can certainly give you some really interesting visual looks for your knitting and, and any of your crafting, you do need to play about with those. And one of the reasons that there's visual interest or tension, if you will, in those opposites is that for each complementary pairing, there one is a cool colour and one is a warm colour. So let me just move the, the wheel away so that we can take a look at this. So what do we mean by cool and warm colours? Well, I'm sure a lot of you have had colours done and you know uh, what that means. But if you don't, that's absolutely fine. And there's a whole other thing when it comes to personal colour analysis. But then we take into a lot of factors there, many of which do crop up in when we're choosing our colours because, you know, the colours that work for you, you want to know what they are. But cool colours tend to be blues and greens and violets. So this side of the, the colour wheel, if you will. And warmer colours are going to be reds, yellows, oranges. That's typically how they, how they work. So cool colours, greens, blue and violets. Warm colours are reds, oranges and yellows. Now cool colours do tend to recede and warm colours appear to advance, to come forward. And what I mean by that, um, Interior designers use that a lot, use different, uh, use cool and warm colours to create visual spaces. 
So they might, to open up a room, they might use a very cool colour to make it look larger. If you've got a very large space, they might use a warm, cosier colour to sort of bring it in. And for any of you that have tried painting rooms in your house, especially small areas, you've probably played with a few colours first before you've got something that you're comfortable with. But t typically cool colours appear to enlarge and warmer colours appear to sort of move in towards you. But that said, of course, there's a caveat to that. Coolness and warmth are relative. How close to blue the colours are, the cooler they are. How close to yellow, essentially, the warmer they are. And for any hue, there are cool and warm versions. So you can get a cool red and a warm blue. You, you know, you can get sort of cool and warm versions of virtually any color, uh, even sort of very neutral colors. So that's why it's really helpful to play about with colors in this way. So you can see what you like. Maybe if you're making something and it all looks a little bit too coldish, um, cool, well, we talk about cool blues all the time, especially for summer. The heat of summer, we like cool blues. They keep us, we feel that they keep us cool. And uh, there's a lot to be said for that because we do know that um, color can affect us. It can affect our mood. It can affect our appetite. It, it's a huge subject. It really is. So there's a few things there to think about. The other thing I want to talk about, there's a couple of other words. There's, there's lots of other words connected with color, but, you know, we haven't got it's, it's a huge subject, as I say, we could talk for it on days, about it on, for days. But the other thing to think about is how dark or lighter color is. And again, we looked at this before. This is a gray scale. And a gray scale is something artists use all the time. And really what, essentially what that means is black is value one. And there's 10 values, if you will. There's lots of different shades of grey, of course. We know that. Um, but as, as far as a grey scale is concerned, this is something that helps with finding the value of a colour. And we just, the grey scale literally is 10 different shades of, 10 different values of grey. Of, of, yeah, starting with black as value one and going lighter through to essentially white. And, and you'll find that with any color, whether it's red, blue, pink, whatever it might be, you can determine the values. And why that matters is that sometimes it's just about balance. If you've got colors sort of pinging everywhere, very bright colors and nothing to balance it out, it can be very harsh. Again, if something is too muted, you might want a pop of color to lift it. Okay, so that's a 10,000 foot overview of basic color theory. But really, where do you start? Where do you start? Yeah, so, so sorry. That, that, as I said, it's a basic overview of color theory. Sorry, I lost one of the things I was looking for then. And there's a lot I haven't mentioned. So that's one of the reasons that you can see why color isn't as simple as it appears and why it's so hard sometimes to put together a bunch of colors. But how does all that theory work for you when you're deciding on several colors for a project? Where do you start? Now, I have all sorts of props here, as you can see. I've got these lovely sort of fringe cards from a, a, a spinner in, in, the, in the UK. I've got all sorts of things here. I've got, as you, as you saw with Mabel, she's actually wearing a dress that's almost like a paint swatch. And actually, that's not a bad thing to have because I'm certainly not suggesting that you go out and buy lots of yarn, not at all. Use yarn oddments from previous projects. Use fabric scraps, paint chips, they're perfect. Colored pencils, whatever's to hand that you can play with. This sort of thing is wonderful. It doesn't even have to be yarn, it could be fabric, but you can really see different colors. There's a hundred different colors here. So you can really see the, the different sort of gradations of color. You can see how they work together. And I, I, I know I showed this before in, in episode 32. I don't suggest that you unravel all these and because then you've got to put them back in the right order. And with 100 colors, that would take a long time and you might miss some. But you can, you can kind of bend these cards. You can match them up. To, you know, you can put them next to each other. It gives you a sense of the 
uh, different colors and how they interact with each other and plus with something like this you've got this lovely gradation so you've got the different values here as you can see you we're looking at different values on our grayscale here and each of these color palettes has several so you know it's a really useful thing if you have something like that it could be bits of fabrics it could be scraps from other projects keep all those little butterflies of of yarn um, and you can really play with those so whatever you have to play with, even your children's crayons, that's fine. They don't need to use them all the time. <laughs> but colors have a gravitational pull on us. We're instinctively drawn to certain hues, certain color families. And having been the owner of a yarn store, nine times out of 10, color was what made the customer pick up a ball of yarn. Then the decision is about its tactile aspect, the suitability for their project, etc. But almost always, always color came first so start there and start with your favorite color start all favorite colors and think about what might work together now in my store we always knitted up items in completely different colors from the pattern um, whether it's just one color or several because one pattern looks very different in one color from another even just a solid color but when you're doing patterns it, it really does make a difference so when you're working and choosing multiple colors takes time so give yourself the time to do that if you ask yourself some other questions too so if you're working with a pattern and I'm going to just turn this light down now because I want you to see the sort of the differences in some of these little balls of yarn so ask yourself about the pattern let's say you're working with a pattern what sort of design is it is it um, stripes is it a gradual blend of colors do you want really bold high contrast colors that leap off the page or leap off the knitting is it high contrast do you want neutrals just with a bright pop of color because neutrals make great backgrounds for pops of colors now again this is back to sort of Oh, the other thing I didn't say about, I'm so sorry, saturation, intensity of color. This is a good example of saturation. These are all sort of neon brights. They're really, really bright. It's saturation really means how bright or muted um, the color is, whatever the color may be. And you can see these three, super bright. These three, not, not so bright. Similar colors. They're not meant to be the same color, but they're very similar. But you can see... These are much more muted, much more muted. They're softer, whereas these are really bright. Now, you, if you're very bold, you might like really bold colors, bright colors in your, in your garment, and you might want to do a garment with, with colors like these. That takes a bold personality. I personally, I love these colors, but I wouldn't use them all together, but I would use one or two of them just to give those bright pops of color. These are very pretty, a bit too muted for, for, for me, but again, you could liven them up with a pop of bright color. So have a think about that. When it comes to neutrals, neutrals are really, really good things to play with. Now, I know a lot of people are a little, I won't say afraid of color, but you're anxious that color, you know, you, you can be worried that color is, just not your thing. So starting off with neutrals is really helpful. And that can be several different, I'm just using sort of creams and beiges here. They don't have to be that, it could be greys. And the neutral, as far as we're concerned, are things that are almost like sort of backdrop colors, uh, background colors. So it's certainly beiges, taupes, creams, black, white, greys. It can be a lot of things, but they, they're basically colors that let the other colors that you use with them shine forward they sort of let them pop out now I did say black and white can be considered as neutrals they can be but they can also be high contrast I'm just lifting these up because we're on a black background but black and white together can be very high contrast black white and red very high contrast again but let's see what happens if we put a neutral with them. High contrast there. I'm holding them in my hands so the black doesn't disappear against the background there. 
So high contrast, you're going to get a vibrant item with that, whether it's stripes, whatever. But maybe that's too much high contrast for you. Swap one of those out. Maybe swap that sort of ivory color with it. Not quite as bold. You could swap it out still further and put the sort of stone color with it. That calms it down completely. You've still got the strength of the red and black, but that kind of tones it down. It grounds it almost. So don't be afraid to play with colors and see how they work for you. Neutrals are, are really, if you're doing a lot of colors, maybe it's a floral sweater or something like that, and you've got several colors, I would always pick some sort of neutral background because then you're going to get the, whatever the motifs you're doing, they're going to really sing out. They're going to really pop for you. So how do we start? This is all very well, you know, to sh show the theories. But again, where do you start? Maybe you have a pattern. You like the design, but you don't like the color. I've just dropped a ball of yarn there. So you don't know what colors you want to use. Where do you go for inspiration? So I'm going to, sh this is just a scarf. This is a printed silk scarf, um, which is particularly pretty colors. And they are looking a bit brighter in that light. But I just want to show you why I picked this, because they're all colors that I like. So maybe I want to make a sweater. Maybe I want to make something with a few colors in this, but I don't know how it's going to work. This is actually a sort of cerise pink. It looks red on the screen, I know, but, but just bear with me. So I certainly don't necessarily want to use all the colors because that would be really quite a kaleidoscope. But I want to pick out a few. But I'm drawn to certain colors. I'm very drawn to pinks. So I would try and get a, you know, a pink that worked with that. I'm not necessarily trying to match it. I'm just trying to, because I know I like these colors, I'm trying to pick out some that would work for me on my project because I don't know what colors I want to use. Then maybe, then there's a blue here, a blue with a sort of shimmer. Yeah, that would work nicely. That would work there. Let me see if I can retrieve the one, the ball of yarn that dropped off the desk. Yes, I can. And there's some lilac there. Maybe I'd want to use that somewhere. There's also this sort of jady green. Now, personally, I'm not going to use that because it reminds me very much, these colors remind me of the 80s and there's nothing wrong with the 80s, but I was there in the 80s and I kind of probably don't want to do it again. So I wouldn't, those are very typical 80s colors, although this, this scarf is not 80s at all. But as soon as I put that green in it, it's, that reminds me of the 80s and, and I don't want to go back there. So. I don't want to use it. And that's another thing. If a color doesn't do, if it doesn't, you know, sit well with you, then, then don't use it. However, having said that, I will come back to that in a moment. But so that's a good start for me. I've got my blue, I've got my pink, I've got this, this mauvey lilac color. Now, maybe I need something to ground it because I'm not going to knit the darker blue. I just don't want it too busy. Whatever I'm going to knit, I want the I might wear it with the scarf, so I want this to be something that works with it, not matching. So I could probably, white might be a bit stark. It would make a nice summery sweater, might be a bit stark. Maybe I'd go with this ivory. I think that would work better, personally. Or if I could get a more silvery tone, I haven't got a silvery gray, but a silvery gray would be pretty. So that's something that you, you can do. So. Those are my colors that I'm going to use, maybe, and they're not meant to match this scarf, but they're going to complement it. Even if I don't wear this scarf with whatever I'm going to knit, I know that the colors will work because I already like them in this. So that's a way that you can start by picking colors that you like. Now, I would say also that you can just, another way to get inspiration is to look at magazines and online images. It doesn't have to be knitting. It can be anything that really appeals to you. So save or take screenshots of color combinations that really please you and look at things you already have. Now, 
I've just said to start with colors you like, but that doesn't mean to say you can't incorporate colors that may not be your favorites. If I can show you this, I have this bag that is very appealing to me. It's a stripy bag. I've had it a long time. I really like the colors in it, how they work together, I should say. We're overrunning a bit here, but I hope you don't mind because we did start a bit late. But you can see here, there's all sorts of colors. Now, I actually wouldn't wear some of these colors on their own. But when they're combined in this sort of stripiness, they're very attractive to me. So again, I could think about the, the sort of taupey brown, sort of rosy brown color. That would work. I like how that, that turquoise, that aqua is. I like that very much. Then this green isn't quite right, but I'm just going to use this just as example. Quite like that with it, actually. And then the yellow. Now, I probably don't want a lot of yellow. Yellow is one of those colors that you don't need a lot of to make a really uh, strong impression. But just look at how these yellow threads really lift this color combination. Without the yellow, these would be very nice, but the yellow really makes it pop. Now, again, I probably want something to ground that. So I might go, that's, that sort of light stone is quite nice, but maybe a bit too muted. So I could go with, that's the ivory, it looks white, I know. But that, those colors on that background would work, and they certainly would work on that too. So it doesn't mean to say I'm going to use all the colors. I'm going to pick out a few and see how they work. So again, if I show you how those are just like that, they're really nice, but as soon as you bring a bit of yellow in, it lifts it, it really pops. Okay. So I want to show you something else, another project. I know there's a lot of movement on the screen today, and I, sorry about that, but it's the only way I can show you. So I want to do this cowl pattern. I think this is a very pretty cowl pattern. It's from um, Vogue Knitting, and it is downloadable. You pay for it, and I will publish the details afterwards of who designed it. It's a very pretty cowl pattern. It takes three colors. Okay, I, I just I, I just really like it, but I'm not so mad about the colors that it's done in They're They're not necessarily colors that I would really enjoy wearing. I think it's very nice, but it's not necessarily my color scheme. But I looked around for things that would how I might want to do it. And my first thought was maybe I'll do it. You know, I'm drawn to black and whites and grays. And my first thought was maybe I'll do it in a sort of gray palette. Let's put that there, otherwise you won't be able to see them. Maybe I'll do it in a gray palette. I love the, this yarn. And I looked at it and I don't know, that didn't quite work. I, I just felt that too low value in terms of color value for me. I didn't think it would work so well. Yes, I could certainly put in a lighter color, but then I'm kind of losing. I didn't really want to do a bright white. I have a lot of black and white and I'm trying not to always have black and white. So I, I was thinking, what else could I do? What could I use to give me inspiration for where I want to go with those, with this cow? And my husband, my wonderful husband, I want, if I can just show you this, I have got a photo, but which way work on. My husband bought me the most wonderful carpet bag a couple of Christmases ago. And I love it. I absolutely love it. It's a very big piece for me to kind of show you. Okay. But you, you get the gist of the colors there. And I took a photo of it so it was easier to handle. Otherwise, I couldn't get it on the screen. <laughs> so this is essentially the front of the bag. So now you've seen the real thing. Now you can just see the photo. So I was thinking, well, what colors would I, you know, could I use? Because I don't want to necessarily copy it exactly. I'm not trying to match it. I'm really just trying to reference the colors. There's my Mary Poppins bag. So I wanted to reference the colors 
doesn't have to be an exact match. I just want to sort of go somewhere with this color story. So I started with the main color. It's a claret, a sort of burgundy, if you will. Quite soft, very pretty. So I'm thinking that would be nice. So my next pick would be a neutral. And on the bag, it's actually really quite a creamy color. So I could use this one, this color. Or I could use this one, which is a bit lighter. Now I've only got three colors that I can play with. So what would I choose? So for the minute, let's just, let's keep that one there. And then my immediate thought was, let's pick out some of the black because there are certainly uh, lines here in black. It features through the, the carpet fabric. There's quite a lot of it. And I'm always drawn to black. So I put that there. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I like it, but it's, it's not how I thought it might look. And yes, I, again, I could swap that out. That lifts it a bit more. That's nice too. That's nice too. But it, it just lacks something. And I was trying to get myself out of my usual black. Always go with black. You know, it's a, it's sort of, it's a safe color for a lot of us. I know that. But I really wanted to get out of that. So then I thought, well, what other colors are in the bag, in the carpet of the bag? Well, there's a sort of tanny color. So there's two versions here. Again, this, there's a, a you know, really quite a sort of caramelly tan. That doesn't grab me to, so much. It's pretty, but it, it's not my, my thing particularly. And then I thought this, which is, which is very beautiful. It's a sort of rose gold almost. It, that's pretty too. But I'm not getting the pop of color that I want. And this is where sometimes, although I said start with your instincts, go with colors that you love. This is where I, I completely went out of the box because I looked at this and look at how this kind of tealy aqua color that's very small amounts, but it's all, all over the carpet bag. And look how that lifts really the color. So I then thought that, and I really like that combination. And this is not a color that I would pick for me for an entire sweater. But when it's combined with these other two, I think that would be lovely. And it's going to complement my bag beautifully. And that wasn't really what I set out to do to find something that matched it. I just wanted something that I could um, go with the color story. And if I want to soften it down, which I don't think I will, I could go, I could swap that one out with that. But I just prefer the lightness of this one. So that's going to be my color combination. And in a, in a, I would not have thought I would pick that kind of tealy, soft, lovely sea green, um, greeny blue. It's not a color that I would use a lot of, but it's amazing, I think, with this combination. And I'm going to really enjoy knitting that up. So when I knit my cowl, those are going to be my colors. So my main color would be where the dark one is here. This is going to be my burgundy. I'm going to use my lighter color as my background. And then my, my green is going to be pretty much where this green is on this one. So sometimes step out of your your box really, or get out of your own way, because I tend to get my own way at times, and try it with a color that you would never have thought would work. And that's what I mean by trying colors you wouldn't normally use. I'm going to try and move the camera back so you can, so I can finish off. I really hope that was helpful to you. I know it's a lot. Um, it, it is a lot. I do know that. Um, because there's so much to do with colour. It's such a big topic. I hope you can see me. I've just got the top of my head, maybe. I'll move back. Anyway, I hope it was a really good, valuable um, episode for you to help you think about how you can use colour, especially if you tend to go with the same colours all the time. And that's a natural thing. There's nothing wrong with it. And that's what I'm saying. Start off what you're familiar with. Start off there because you know you're going to like that. 
it's it's quite difficult sometimes to go with a completely different color palette that you're not used to. That can be a bit shocking. And you don't want to knit for hours and then find that you've made a garment that is gorgeous, but you're not comfortable in it. I would say also when you, you got your colors together, do do a test swatch. See how you like them together. See how you like them relating together. I know sometimes doing swatches is tedious, but it will save you hours in the end, at the end of the day, and it'll save you a lot of heartache too. So do your swatches, but before you do your swatches, take the time to choose your colors. Have fun with it. You know, colors are a wonderful, fun thing. Have fun with your colors, but do take time. It's worth spending the time and the effort. So as I say, you can use anything that you have to hand, your children's colors, uh, crayons and pencils, paint chips, fabric scraps. Start with something that appeals to you and then go from there. If, if you, it is such a big subject. I could talk for England on it and I've talked far too much already tonight. I'm so sorry we have gone over. So, but I hope it was worth it to you. If you have any questions or you have any comments, as always, you can put them in the thread below. And as always, this episode and all others of Knit and Matters can be found under the videos tab on this page. And they're also uploaded uploaded to our YouTube channel of the same name, Knit and Matters Afterwards. And they're also on our website, starmattersinternational.com. So you can watch the replays at any time. And if you're searching for this replay later, it's called Color Combining and it's season two, episode 12. Thank you again so much for watching. Join me again next week. And in the meantime, stay well, stay safe and stay knitting. Bye for now.